Since the beginning of time, glass has been the perfect material for a multitude of household items such as dining room tables. Although this medium is quite fragile in most cases, it can also be tough enough to hold the most lavish of dinner parties. If you are curious as to how this see-through material was implemented in making beautiful yet practical tables, stay tuned and watch some of the best selections we have compiled for you. Hello hello reviewers, welcome back to our channel. Today we have brought to you glass top, end table, side table or coffee table design ideas for your inspiration. Watch the video until the end to never miss a thing and choose an inspiring design for your next project. If you are new to the channel and if you like what you see, please please consider subscribing to our channel and smash the notification bell so that you'll be the first one to be notified when you upload new videos. Your subscription means a lot to us and then inspires us to create more content. If you are already a subscribed member, please like and share this video so that it could reach a wide range of audience. One of the biggest curiosities of the world is how glass was discovered. In fact, historians believe that the clear material was made from a stray lightning bolt that hit the sand on a beach. Since glass is primarily composed of sand, sand components known as silica, since then, production of this medium has skyrocketed and clearly became a staple of every item ever created and used today. Glass as an independent object, mostly as beads, dates back to about 2500 BC. It originated perhaps in Mesopotamia and was brought later to Egypt. Vessels of glass appeared about 1450 BC. From Mesopotamia and Egypt, glassmaking using the basic soda lime silica composition traveled to Phoenicia along the coast of present-day Lebanon. From there, the art spread to Cyprus, Greece, and by the 9th century BC, the Italian peninsula. After the conquest of Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC, glassmaking skills spread to the east, including the Indian subcontinent. Glass beads and bangles, characteristic of the Hindu culture of about 200 BC, have been discovered in Nevasa excavations. Glassmakers in Syria prospered during this time, specializing in plain walls of single colors. In Alexandria, about 100 BC, the millefiori or thousand flowers process of making open beakers and shallow dishes was developed. In this process, a shape core was made, perhaps of mud, to which sections of colored glass canes were attached. The core and canes were placed into an outer mold to keep the shape while the glass fused in an oven. After removing the mold and core, the glass surfaces were ground smooth. Cross sections of the colored road showed a striking mosaic effect. Near the beginning of the Christian era, the Phoenicians learned how to blow glass with a blowing iron. The blowing iron was an iron tube about 1.5 meters or 5 feet long, with a mouthpiece at one end and a knob for holding soft glass at the other end. A blob of molten glass was collected on the knob end and rolled into a suitable shape on a flat surface of iron or stone called a marble. The shape could then be blown inside a mold or freely in air by with occasional reheating. A solid iron rod called the pontil was used to warp, twill, or pinch glass into desired complexities. Handle, stem, or bottom also could be fused to the vessel when desired.
The Romans and Egyptians probably used sand mixed with ground seashells as raw materials for silica and lime and hardwood ash as the source of soda. They also showed astonishing skill in the way they used metallic oxides as colorizers. Very small differences in oxide content can drastically affect the final color of the glass, yet colors and tint were reproduced time and again with remarkable consistency. Copper was used to make the green and ruby red glass. Iron produced black, brown and green. Roman attempts to make flat glass by pouring the slabs about 12 mm or half inch thick were unrewarding. Proper transparency could not be achieved by such means without grinding and polishing the cast material. The lack of transparency and the difficulty encountered in making any but small panes by this method led to the introduction of stained glass windows first used in Eastern Roman Empire in the early 12th century. The Romans were perhaps the first to develop flat glass for use as windows, a bathhouse window of greenish-blue color. Most likely obtained by casting was discovered in the ruins of Pompeii. In the Middle Ages, the crown process for making window glass was a mass of glass was gathered and blown into a globe at the end of the blowing iron and marveled on a conical shape. A pontil rod was attached to the other end and the blowing iron was cracked off, leaving a jagged opening. The glassmaker then took the globe into the glory hall or the mouth of the furnace, reheating it and at the same time spinning it to keep it from sagging. At some point, Centrifugal force caused the globe to flash into a flat disk, which grew larger with continued spinning. Upon cooling, the disk was cracked off the pontier road. Such glass was not truly flat. The disk was very uneven, being thickest near the center and marked by concentric circular waves. At the very middle was the fractured knob or crown making the point of former attached to the pontier. Discs more than about 1.5 meters in diameter were hardly practical. Most medieval church windows were made from broad glass. In this process, which continued to be practiced with variations into the 20th century, a large cylinder as much as 50 cm in diameter and 175 cm long was made by repeated gathering, blowing and swinging. The cylinder was a slit when cold and gradually opened with moderate reheating to become flat. Glass made from this process was flatter than crown glass and did not have the telltale crown in the middle. Moreover, it could be made in much larger pieces. The use of compressed air in the early 1900s allowed the cylinders to be blown as large as 75 cm in diameter and up to 9 meters in length. Despite its advantages over crown glass, broad glass had surface waviness and variations in thickness. For a higher degree of flatness, glass had to be cast generally on a steel table and rolled. The cast plates were subsequently ground and polished. In the Bicherox process introduced in Germany in the 1920s, about a ton of glass was melted in a pot and carried, carried to the table, where it was poured through a pair of rollers. Rolling the sheet reduced the amount of grinding needed for flatness. Two continuous flat glass machines were introduced about the turn of the 20th century. 
the updraw machine designed by Emil Folkold of Belgium and the Irving Colburn machine developed at the Liebe Owens Glass Company in Charleston. In the forecold process, a 1 to 2 meter wide steel mesh bait was introduced into the molten glass at the working end of the furnace. The cooler glass adhered to the bait and was pulled upward between water-cooled tubes that solidified the sheet edges. The sheet was then gripped at the edges by non-chilling asbestos rollers and pulled farther up the draw tower. The Colburn machine borrowed its design from the paper making process. The sheet was drawn vertically from the glass surface, but after rising only a few meters, it was gradually bent over a polished nickel alloy roller to become horizontal, ultimately traveling into the annealing layer. In both processes, glass was marked with undulations caused by the pulling and rolling gear. In addition, the glass sheets, like all flat glasses produced by earlier processes, has to be ground and polished for optical clarity. The development of the twin grinding and polishing machine in 1935 at the Peelington Brothers work in Doncaster, England, made it possible for ply to be made by horizontal flow so a double roller process and then ground and polished online. Finally, it took seven year, years of intense development before Alastaik Pilkington introduced in 1959 the float glass process, which altogether eliminated the need for grinding and polishing. A further development in electro float process introduced in 1967 made it possible to implant copper and other metals, metal ions into the upper surface of glass using thin as an electrode at the bottom and a fixed copper or other metal electrode halfway down the bulb at the top. Beginning the late 1600s glass makers in England wanted to find a way to take this universal medium and make it more durable. The intention was to create a form of glass that could withstand any element and environment it, it inhabited. After running a few different experiments, the glass makers in England realized that adding lead oxide to glass would create a more universal product because it would create the strength that manufacturers were looking for. Continuing its groundbreaking journey into the late 1600s, the newfound durable glass made it its way to France, where the French glassmakers developed plate glass, the answer to glass tabletops. Unlike traditional glass, plate glass could be used in a multitude of settings and could withstand the risk of cracks. Since then, Different variations of durable glass have hit the market and continues to dominate the world lead to this very day. Well, dear viewers, as you can see in the video, we have compiled a number of interesting glass top in tables, side tables and coffee table design ideas. Which one is your favorite and why? Let us know in the comment section. By now you know that our channel is full of inspiring videos which you can use daily in as an inspiration. If you like our content, please consider subscribing to our channel if you haven't already and also smash the notification bell so that you'll be the first one to be notified when we upload new videos. Thank you for watching until the end. We look forward to seeing you in our next video. Until then, stay safe and stay blessed.